<laughs> All right, Mom. Yeehaw. Hello, my beautiful friends. Welcome back again for a very exciting topic, as always. Um, <laughs> it's okay, Mom. We'll forgive you for shouting. Um, I understand being excited. Uh, you can tell I'm excited to talk about red team stuff. Uh, I did my her all red. I'm not turning it blue next week for blue team, but, uh, but I am very psyched for this topic, uh, because I think red team stuff is generally the juicy stuff that gets people interested. Like, Ooh, I can hack things, which, uh, is, is cool. It is cool. Um, more of a blue teamer myself. Um, but I am super excited to sort of just give a lay of the land for the red team and, uh, yeah, let's get started. So I switch over to... Alright. Uh, yeah, y'all know this. You are your teacher. I'm just a red-haired lady on the internet that points you at things and shows you cool stuff and hopefully you get interested to uh, pursue stuff on your own. It's not just gonna be... If you want a job in security, it's gonna be more than attending my class every week that's going to build the competency within yourself to become a cybersecurity professional and make that, uh, that Skrilla. So this episode is on attacker mindset and methods. Um, we talked a little bit before about how each side is, has sort of like different problems to solve for. Um, so this time around, we are going to dig into sort of the goals of what attackers have and then li literally how they do it and how they sort of attack the external network as well as the internal network because they kind of have different different ways of going about it for each. So um, we'll be covering uh, the mindset as was mentioned and uh, sort of what are they doing? How do they do what they do? Uh, where do they do what they do to do what they do? And then we'll go briefly over some external attacks and we will actually perform an external attack. I'll show you how easy it is to hack into something that's meant to be hacked into. <laughs> uh, and then we'll go over internal attacks and sort of uh, how they sort of leverage the human element to get inside, usually, is the easiest way to go about it. So, uh, attacker mindset. Uh, they want stuff. Uh, they're going to find a way in if they're really determined. And a lot of times there will eventually be a way in, especially if they're leveraging all they can with the external and internal options available to them. Um, a lot of times they're just looking for low hanging fruit, uh, just sort of scanning the internet for various insecure things just to see what they can do and get away with. Um, but other times, uh, they're doing it with a purpose and just going after one thing very, uh, single-mindedly. So hopefully you don't have uh, any uh, advanced persistent threats as enemies. <laughs> uh, so they've got numerous goals, um, but most of them involve money. Uh, they want to make it. They want to take it. And uh, they also want to make money from the information they get. Because information is also worth money. Um, you know, they're the attacks that were observed um, with APT1 that we talked about last week, they, they were not just getting R&D. They were often looking at uh, calendars, finding, uh, you know, meeting invites, who's going to what meeting, uh, to not only sort of figure out the organization, but also figure out structure. Um, they can also monitor what that company is doing. So a competing company that has this information, uh, or would want this information, it would be worth money to them, um, could use it to leverage um, their position in the markets or or know what sort of uh, moves that competitor might be making. Um, so all of that information is money at this point. I mean, you're being mined for information, just uh, sort of like what you do and what you click on. And, uh, you know, there's only so much you can do about that. But um, when a, an attacker is doing it, it's usually to make money in some way. Um, you know, there are ideologically driven attacks, but uh, a lot of times that's like website defacement or taking down a website with a distributed denial of service attack. 
um, just to make that company lose money by their customers not being able to access it. Um, so a lot of times those might be ideological, but ultimately they're to, you know, take money from you. So you're not getting that money you know, when your website's down. Um, so they have numerous goals and there are numerous holes to reach those numerous goals. And that's because, um, there are a lot of ways in. And so there's this terminology used in the security world, um, about risk. And so threats are the things that are actually taking advantage of the vulnerabilities and the vulnerabilities always exist on your assets. You're never going to have a perfect system. It's always just trying to approach, you know, the highest level of security you can at every level, which is a concept called defense in depth. So, you know, even if you don't catch them here, you've got these defenses here and you've got these defenses here and you've got monitoring here. So you've got all these layers of security that can hopefully catch the attacker, you know, at some point in that cycle down downstream. So your assets, everything you, you have in your network is going to have some level of vulnerability. And the things that take advantage of those vulnerabilities are threats. And so that's why they call them, you know, advanced persistent threats or threat actors, because they are the people acting upon those threats um, that exploit those vulnerabilities that are in your defenses. And this creates risk for the business. And uh, if you take the Security Plus, there's a whole chapter on risk and business risk. And uh, I think it's really good for an information security professional to understand because then you're speaking the language of the business. And uh, that's a lot easier to sell why security needs to do something or needs a tool that does something for them. Um, because, you know, security is kind of like one of those things that uh, you don't spend money on it until it's you, you feel like it's really necessary. And you might lose a ton of money and, you know, you might lose your entire business if you didn't have it. So often uh, IT administrators often joke uh, probably tragically about how when everything's running smoothly, they're like, what do we pay you for? And then when things go to heck, they're like, we pay you, like, we pay you all this money. How come it's not working? Uh, and security is very similar, um, in that, you know, when, when you don't have a breach, uh, or at least you don't think you have a breach, um, then it's like, well, what is this all for? Um, but then when you catch stuff, they're like, oh, oh, good. Let's throw money at you to keep that from happening. So I just wanted to do a little doodle about some of the avenues in which that occurs. Ooh, uh, secrets. I drew it before. Oh, don't look. Okay. Let's build up a new one real quick here. Uh, new layer. And I think we are good to go. So, oh, and then tab F. Another tab. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, um, in the middle, let's say we've got our Megacorp, our friendly neighborhood. I'm going to make uh, that. What is the combination? There we go. Megacorp. And so Megacorp has these things worth money inside that's corporate data and that's customer data. I'm using corporate on the left side because let's say that there's a line dividing Megacorp. And so we've got corporate data on the inside. We've got customer data on the outside, which is how we often do our business. So Megacorp has, uh, let's say their website, uh, their web database and their mobile app. So here's the site, here's the database. And here's mobile. And all three of those things are messing with customer data that is pointed outside. So an attacker is often hitting either the website or by seeing the site's interaction with the database, uh, hitting the database or hitting the mobile app, which may not be as well secured as the original site and its connection to the database because it's a whole other environment that's been set up to work with cell phones. So it may not have been as securely configured. So the attacker can attack all three of these things and try to get customer data. Now they could also harvest customer data and then use your website to take the customer's data that they've, they've harvested from another site or another place. But oftentimes they're looking for holes 
in the database itself so that they can uh, say find a user that interacts with the database, like a like an internal corporate username that interacts with the database. And if they get access to that user, now they can hit the entire database and get all of your customer data because this customer data does need to be accessible to the outside internet, um, but you are putting at it, it at risk. Now there are lots of controls and it's meant to be you know secured. So if best practices are followed at every possible level, it shouldn't be able to uh, be extracted, but uh, it's very difficult to do that. There's lots of moving pieces and we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, the other part of things is the internal network. So what do we have in, oh, that's not my best work. So let's say we've got the infrastructure, like the network infrastructure. So that's supporting our websites and databases. And uh, also it's supporting our sort of employee network, which is another one of our um, circles here. And that employee circle, you know, then you've got their access to the web, you've got their email, you've got them, you know, remoting in. So additional pieces of infrastructure there. And then here you've got like the physical space um, that all of these are housing corporate data. And a lot of times are housing customer data as well. So this this stuff on this side can be super lucrative because not only do you potentially have access to the customer stuff, you have access to corporate stuff, which is also information that is worth money. So the attackers, um, you know, there are strategies to hit the external side, but ideally if you can get internal and break through that wall and establish a foothold inside, now you have access to a whole bunch of other things that could potentially be worth a lot of money. And um, so, yeah, that's a, that's an idea of sort of why why I'm separating the space because the these attacks should be thwarted if it's well configured. Again, that's hard to do, um, but uh, they should not. These are designed in a way to be externally accessible, so. There are lots of precautions to make sure it's nothing is making the jump uh, into your network. So uh, that's just an idea. That doesn't say it doesn't happen. Uh, there are exploits that are probably worth millions um, before they're announced that uh, you know can exploit from the outside. But we'll talk about that briefly. Uh, so we doodled them. So external exploitation. Uh, yeah, there's a hole in the armor somewhere. <laughs> there's an excellent project out there on the internet that I suggest looking up called the OWASP Top 10, and that's the Open Web Applica Application Security Project. Because the internet is sort of, ooh, I see a, just, oh, I see just a streak of my green screen on the side here. <laughs> Ah, yeah, there it goes. There's a, a hole in reality that I just closed. Um, so the OWASP top 10 uh, tracks 10 of the sort of top web application vulnerabilities and sort of how they're exploited and how to mitigate them. Um, I do want to go to the website. Um, and yeah, the reason that uh, this exists at all is because there are lots of moving pieces to get a web application working correctly. And we are very used to, at this point, having web applications. You know, there's we have tons of apps on our phones. There's an app for every gosh darn thing. And um, because there's lots of moving pieces, there are lots of things that can go wrong. Um, I'm going to briefly go to the OWASP top 10. And we can just really quickly review um, the top one every year is SQL injection. And what that is, is like SQL is like a table database that can, you know, have queries passed to it and based on your permissions and who you are, and you can authorize access to various information, it can pull information from a database and return it to you. But the thing is, is that uh, when commands are entered into that field, if there is not some sort of validation of that field, that that should only contain, let's say, letters and numbers, but not semicolons, backslashes, brackets, and, and all these other things that are used in the actual SQL code, 
because if, if the right combination of injection measures are um, combined together, they can inject code, SQL code, that it will just accept and run. So, so if you be like, once you find that injection, you can often be like, ah, show me a table where, uh, you know, X table name equals password or starts with P and then list all the P tables. So then they can sort of enumerate what your tables are like, and then they can just download all of it, or they could delete all of it. Um, so yeah, SQL injection is something that could be literally uh, disappear overnight if everyone validated their inputs. <laughs> uh, there's a few others that are pretty common security problems and other things, but authentication that can be broken, uh, sensitive data that can be accessed uh, just by anybody, uh, you know, proper role control hasn't been implemented on the table. And you can, you can go through this misconfiguration, uh, cross-site scripting. These are all fascinating, interesting little things. Um, and then here's the thing I like to do is uh, logging and monitoring. But uh, yeah, it'll explain each one of these things and how not to do it and how the attacker does it. Uh, so very cool. OWASP top 10, definitely uh, suggest checking out. And uh, yeah, so we just mentioned some of the things they do when they poke around. That is SQL injection, a uh, very common one. Uh, a long time ago, if you remember, there was a group called LulzSec, Lulz like LOL, but L-U-L-Z because hackers. And uh, actually a few of those folks went to University of Advancing Technology here in uh, Phoenix uh, area. And uh, yeah, I think got some jail time for that. Uh, but basically they just accessed uh, Sony's uh, like PlayStation user databases. And I don't remember exactly what they did with it, but uh, they accessed it and they joked about it on the internet and Sony tracked them down and uh, they got jail time and such. Um, another thing that they do is distributed denial of service or DDoS. Uh, now you could have a denial of service, a DOS, but that just means one thing is trying to overload something else, a denial of service. Um, to disrupt business operations. When you get a bunch of machines together to try and deny service to legitimate customers, that's a distributed denial of service. Um, there was a attack by a botnet called Mirai a few years ago that sort of moved the bar of what level of DDoS was possible um, because they, they measure it in like how many megabits of information is being just thrown at the network to try and parse and like handle, um, because eventually that infrastructure will overload itself, especially if it can't determine who is a legitimate customer and who is a just a, you know, a smart refrigerator or a smart toaster uh, trying to attack them. Um, and see, that's the thing is that Mirai, the way it was able to achieve an unprecedented amount of gigabytes per second of information hitting this uh, these websites was by compromising Internet of Things devices, which it is sad that there have not been any like regulations to force strong security policies onto Internet of, Thing Internet of Things devices, because a lot of people are like, oh, well, I can get my smart refrigerator and now I can know what's inside or I can like cook things in a microwave with my smart microwave or whatever that people use them for. But Oftentimes the vendor just uses like a default user and password on that device. And then what those devices do, um, they use a protocol called UPnP or U plug and play that tells the router like, Hey, I need to, I need a hole for me to talk to the outside internet and, uh, put me on port 25,000 so that I can, you know, microwave stuff for my master. Um, but then if that, if that microwave uh, has a vulnerability, um, there's a website called Shodan.io um, that security professionals use all the time, hackers use all the time. And it's, it is scanning the internet constantly, every IP range, every port, and trying to find out what ports are open and what returns when you hit that port. Um, like what sort of response are you getting back? So if they're able to fingerprint the way that that microwave responds to a request, then now they can use Shodan and find every uh, connected version of that microwave on the current internet. 
So uh, Mirai was a smart collection of exploits of Internet of Things devices that made a massive botnet that no one had seen before. And now there's a few massive botnets um, going around nowadays. But uh, yeah, the whole idea is to disrupt business operations. Uh, they often rent these out. You could rent out part of a botnet on the darknet. Like, oh, uh, you need this many megabytes per second to, you know, hit a WordPress site of someone you don't like or, or what have you, whatever it is. But uh, yeah, that's something hackers do. The last thing I have on here is exploiting vulnerabilities. And that does usually gain you internal access, or at least, you know, gets you within a place where you're not supposed to be, especially from the outside. And a lot of times those vulnerabilities are very, very valuable. Um, that's some of what the uh, US government's equation group was holding on to in the release by Shadow Brokers. And as far as how this stuff goes on the dark net, Oftentimes it'll be sort of nebulous, like this is a popular network uh, router vulnerability, uh, zero day, that allows you remote code access. And they won't say the name because then the vendor will be like, well, is it us? Is it us? Is it Cisco? Is it uh, Realtek? Is it Microtech, Microtech? Uh, et cetera, and so forth, regardless. Um, then they'll be like, uh, here's proof of exploit. Here's me connecting to this uh, popular corporate website and getting inside. And then they'll sell it on the dark net for a million dollars, a few hundred thousand. Uh, regardless, you know, who knows how long someone's going to hold on to that uh, before they just decide to distribute it to everyone. But oftentimes they get a good amount of use out of it because they're going to make a ton of money, money off of their access that they gain with it. Uh, so, yeah, that's some of the cool badness that folks do. Uh, so I just wanted to talk about Metasploit real briefly. Um, and uh, actually, hack stuff with Metasploit. So I'm going to, oh, I should have resized some of my windows here. But uh, there's a great uh, set of uh, virtual machines. Uh, we'll go over next month about how to use virtual machines. But I've got both of these virtual machines running on my network. This one is called Metasploitable <laughs> because it is meant to be metasploited. Uh, so I've got it running now on, uh, as, a, as a virtual machine on my computer. And then I've got Kali Linux uh, running as well. And Kali is a Linux distribution that collects a ton of attacker-related tools. You can see wireless attacks, password attacks, database assessments, web application analysis. It is just chock full of tools to do uh, hacker stuff. So we are just going to use the Metasploit framework, which is, is on Kali. And I'm going to see if I can make it a little bit bigger. Are you going to like that, Kali? OK, that's pretty good. And I'll make this bigger as well. Let's zoom in a bit. OK, that looks pretty good. You can kind of see what I'm doing. Um, so, um, the first tool we're going to use, uh, I'm cheating. I'm just copy pasting commands that I, uh, put in earlier. It's a tool called Nmap. Uh, Nmap is, uh, a lot of people use it all the time internally to just, uh, figure out what's going on in their network, but it is also a reconnaissance tool. You can, uh, uh, find things on your network, uh, by using Nmap and finding out what ports are open, that sort of thing. Uh, actually let's, let's show this for this part here first. Um, so this is using this Ethernet adapter to scan. I forget what all the flags mean. Uh, use the manual and find out. Uh, I'm going to link to a Metasploit Instructable that I used to make this part. Um, but we're having it scan this part of the network that we know that our, that all of our devices are on. Uh, if you see over here, really small, it says the internet address is 10.0.2.4, but our Kali box doesn't know that yet. So first we're going to scan this IP range, the 10.2.0 to 255, and look, it found Nmap scan report for 10.0.2.4. Host is up. I received a SYNAC, and we'll talk about those next month as well. That's basically a computer saying hello to each other. Next, I'm going to have uh, Nmap look specifically at this address in a verbose mode to tell me what ports are open and what you're able to figure, figure out what is on the end of those ports. This is very similar to what Shodan.io is doing, um, but on the entire internet. Uh, da, da, da. Make me make me the root user. Okay, now I'm root. 
Uh, so I'm going to scan that IP address I found earlier. Let's see what is on it. Oh, God, it's so big now. I can't really. So look at all those open ports it found already. Uh, let's just make this as wide as possible. Uh, so looking up here, wow, we've got a lot of ports open. So it Nmap uh, brings back uh, the port numbers and the service that should be on that port number. This is just a guesstimate because you could put whatever port, you could put whatever service you want on whatever port, but most ports are sort of reserved for um, specific types of traffic, just for a sort of legibility or ease of access, knowing what's there. And uh, these are all the ports we found open. And then by using the verbose mode and it doing a little bit of talking with the thing at that port, it's able to figure out based off of either the banners it gets back or the way that it responds, it can get back literal versions of applications that are running on that port with that port open. So we see all of these things here because this is Metasploitable. Um, of course, there are attacks for every single one of these services uh, that are running open uh, to us. But we're going to attack this specific one up here, VSFTPD, um, which is an FTP service. So um, let's start up Metasploit. Uh, start Metasploit. Already got the database running. And let's get hacking. So all right, now we're in Metasploit, which is a command line tool. Um, but basically what Metasploit is, it's a framework for attacking. So lots of people contribute exploits or payloads to the Metasploit framework, which collects all of the things and sort of interconnects them in a way that, so you're just using Metasploit, but ultimately you can use tons of different exploits, tons of different payloads. You can store the kinds of attacks that have been successful and your the loot you've collected. Um, that is literally a command uh, that I'll show you in a sec. But uh, the idea is to just sort of, I mean, you can see right here, 2006 exploits and uh, 562 payloads, et cetera, so forth. So this is a an exploit framework. So first we're gonna look for, oh, Metasploit, can we attack this poor vulnerable VSFTPD service? Why, yes, we can. I have this lovely little exploit right here for you to use. Um, so I'm gonna copy that. First, I could get, I could ask for info on that. Like, what is the deal with that? And it's like, well, it's got, it's got a vulnerab vulnerability database number. Um, it's got some information about the actual attack. Describes what it does. It exploits a malicious backdoor. Uh, gives us information about the payload, the options that are required when we uh, run run the exploit, and then just a little bit of information about here, like how is it ranked, and what platform, etc., so forth. So let us go ahead and 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 so the search command is pretty cool. You can search by uh, reference numbers, the CVE, which is uh, the people who do MITRE ATT&CK, the MITRE uh, organization that we talked about last last week. They also have a vulnerability database that is uh, categorized by CVEs. Um, so you can search, like if you, if you enumerate, like, oh, they're running MySQL version six, then you can search for uh, CVEs for MySQL, and then you could uh, see if Metasploit has it here. So let's just go ahead and use the exploit. So now we're like in the exploits world. You can see this is now in red. We're like uh, in it now. So we can show the options that it needs to run. So it needs an R host uh, to attack, and it's going to say the current setting uh, for the port is 21, which is normally the FTP. Uh, so we're going to set the R host to our poor Metasploitable server, I think it was 10.4, 10.0.2.4. And now that is set and we are ready to rock and roll. So then we run it and backdoor service has been spawned already, found the shell, boom! We have a shell. And what that means is I can go over here and I'm in uh, the, the sort of home directory of this Metasploit thing. So I could make a file called 
touch don't touch.txt. So there's that file. We can see that file. I'm going to make this bigger. No, unfortunately, it doesn't really work that well. Um, so I've got, uh, if I make it bigger, does it? No, it doesn't work. So anyway, I created a file called don't touch.txt over on my Metasploitable service. But now I have a session inside of my Metasploitable VM. I have taken it over. So I'm first like I type ls to see where I'm at. Oh, I'm on the root file system. OK. Uh, I want to go into the home drive and then, uh, yeah, let's go in the MSF admin and, oh, look, there's don't touch dot TXT, which I could just take if I really wanted to. Um, regardless, we can do all sorts of cool stuff at this point, but, um, something that the, uh, Linux operating system, uh, utilizes for sort of user control is, um, a file called Etsy password. Um, this gives you usernames and then their user groups and their user IDs um, and sort of their home directory. So it doesn't give you passwords, but uh, there is something that does give you passwords and that's the shadow file. So these, a lot of these don't have passwords, but you can see the Postgres file. This is a password hash. So it's not an exact password. It's like if your password was cats, that could say cats, but it's been run through an algorithm and just being a hash, so it's a little bit more secure. And as long as you're using powerful hashing uh, algorithms, you wouldn't be able to crack the password backwards um, by having the hash. Basically, it's just a brute force method of looking in the dictionary and just running tons of tons of things through that algorithm until you're like, ha, ah, I found, here's the hash match. So the password is cats. Um, so the cool thing about Metasploit is that, uh, I can put this session in the background. Yeah. So now I'm back to the Metasploit framework, but I have that session. Uh, I think it's sessions or is it? Yes. So shell one is from me to 10.0.2.04. And, uh, I've got that shell on port 6200. It opened a new port, uh, to speak back to me. Um, so I could now find another tool I might want to use. So let's say I want all of those, those hashes of those passwords. There is for various machines, uh, hash dumps. So this one right here is for Linux post Linux gather hash dump. So I'm going to use post Linux gather hash dump. And now we're in the hash dump exploit. And uh, what are the options here? Uh, so it needs a session to use. So we're going to set session one. Session is now set to one. And uh, let's see, do I have any loot right now? Oh, it shows my old loot. So anyway, I'm running it and uh, boom, it just found all those hashes and it brought it back to the loot uh, directory. Now, now there's two versions of it because I didn't clear the database before I did this, but I wanted to make sure it would run for the demo. Uh, so we've got all our loot here and then it has already parsed it into something for credentials. So if I type creds, it's got, uh, you know, the various usernames along with the hashes here. And then, uh, there are additional things I can now use like a program called Jack the Ripper to sort of hit these hashes and attempt to crack them. So, uh, yeah, Metasploit builds a database as you're working so that it's sort of saving all this useful information. And the reason, like this is developed by a company called Rapid7, which does uh, penetration tests. And the way, the reason this is great is because, you know, they can start attacking a client that has paid for their services. And now they're building the report of what they've done uh, sort of at the same time of exploiting the, the customer. So anyway, Attackers do still use Metasploit. Uh, this, uh, I mean, hopefully you have defenses and, and lots of antiviruses now, you know, if they see Metasploit uh, running on a machine, it will try and find it. But uh, Metasploit also has its Meterpreter shell, which is a way to run inside the computer's RAM and never put a file on the hard disk, only exist in memory and keep the sessions there. So you might be able to detect behavior of Metasploit, but you're not detecting an executable like Metasploit.exe hasn't ran on the system and yet they still have a connection inside. So Metasploit is super cool. Um, I'm going to link to an introduction afterwards uh, that I went through to 
make this um, as well as uh, a lovely person called web webponized on YouTube uh, that did this particular exploit but uh, yeah that's one of them there's another popular one called cobalt strike uh, that uh, is very similar has modules and has different ways of establishing establishing persistence on a machine but I mean what's happening right here this metasploitable VM this could be like a corporate network device and what we did here in Metasploit could be you just putzing around on the internet or some some person who is wanting to do badness onto some corporate network. So, I mean, this is literally, you could imagine there was the internet here rather than just my network, my computer's talking to itself. Um, but that's the idea. So, yeah, it's super cool. It's really fun to play with. Um, you know, the next level of fun is to start building detections. So you start running that exploit and doing exploitations, but then you have detection frameworks in place to catch your activity and alert you that, hey, you're hacking yourself. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's Metasploit. I think it's super cool. I haven't touched Metasploit in a long, long time, so that was super fun for me. Um, so yeah, that's, that's that. We hack stuff. Uh, the next part I wanted to talk on, and I am killing it on time. Sweet, we're gonna come in super early. So is internal exploitation. So as I say down below, the most vulnerable asset are the humans inside because those humans have access to the network. So often you can exploit those humans to get their access. Uh, so I think a, you know, fortunately for society and unfortunately for security, people just love to help, uh, help. <laughs> um, and you know, that's great because, uh, you know, society needs people helping each other to run and uh, be worth existing. And uh, unfortunately, that can be abused. Trust can be abused. And uh, I, I recommend in the in the after links sort of deep dive project, a book by famous 90s hacker Kevin Mitnick. Um, I actually have two of his business cards, which are a it's a business card, but it has a set of lockpicks you can break out of the business card. <laughs> Um, but he wrote a book, uh, he's wrote, written a few books, but he wrote a book about his sort of history before he got, uh, sort of caught by the FBI. And now he helps the FBI as well as all sorts of other companies as a penetration tester and social engineer, because his specialty, it blows my mind how good, naturally good he is, uh, or just what a knack he has for social engineering, which is basically like abusing human trust to get information. My favorite, I'm just going to say my favorite part of the book is he was trying to get someone's information from the DMV because he had like their name and wanted to know where they lived. And what's interesting about Kevin is he kind of wanted to do most of this stuff just to prove that he could, not necessarily to hurt anybody or abuse anybody. It was more to just have information and get information and find out what he could get. So he wanted information from the DMV. So he found out when he called the DMV and sort of asked, pretended to be a police officer um, asking for information and they were like, oh, well, what's your pin code? And he's like, oh, oh yeah, I, I, I forgot to get it. Uh, you know what? I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get that and get back to you. So now he knows that there's a pin code, <laughs> even though, you know, that was a security measure, but now he knows there's a pin code. So then he calls and pretends to be a police officer and it's a, a police officer, like IT person is like, Hey, uh, hi there. So, uh, yeah, I'm just uh, checking our records here, just making sure we've got everything up to date. And uh, the pin code I have for y'all is uh, 81532. And the person's like, oh, no, no, it's not 81532. It's 43872. Yes, thank you. Great. Awesome. And now he has the pin code that he can now call uh, a DMV and now have the pin code, the security measure that was just offered to him by someone being nice. <laughs> And that's what they count on is uh, people being nice. Uh, they can also exploit fear and urgency. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that in a sec, but uh, yeah, people just love to help and uh, that's great for hackers. Uh, the next thing that's uh, fortunate for hackers, unfortunately for every company ever, is that people are curious. And uh, the particular attack I'm thinking here is a really good one that is still 
one of the highest success rates um, of any attack. They use it in the show Mr. Robot uh, a few times, actually, because it is so successful and it works all the time. And that is the USB drop attack. And you literally just drop USB drives in a company parking lot. Somebody's going to plug it into their work machine. Someone will do it. And the, the percentages are pretty high. It's over 50% most of the time. And unless a company has a very specific training protocol about like, hey, don't plug in crap from the parking lot in your work computer. Because uh, even though there are defenses against malware so supposedly being on it, you could have a USB drive that when it plugs in, it tells the computer, hey, I'm a keyboard. Let me know what's up with the keyboard. And then once it has access to the keyboard, spawns a command shell and reaches out to the internet to the attacker's infrastructure. And now they get a beep like, oh, hey, someone someone plugged in that USB drive and now I have a computer inside the network that's talking to me. Would you like to talk? Uh, would you like to take over their machine and do whatever you want? Uh, so... Yeah, um, unfortunately for us, uh, there, and that's why we have to have detections because um, other, otherwise we wouldn't be able to find that stuff. And so, uh, yeah, there's lots of ways in. The next thing I wanted to talk very briefly about before the quiz is um, spear phishing. And I mean, just regular phishing too, but uh, spear phishing means uh, doing a little more legwork um, before you send that phishing email. So, I mean, some of the examples of how successful these have been. I was reading one, I can't remember which APT, but they uh, advanced persistent threat if y'all weren't here last week. Um, so those are nation state actors usually that really want to get in a place. So they send these very carefully crafted emails to get a user to click on or do something. So this one, they had done enough research on this guy to find out that his daughter had soccer practice and the coach sent out PDFs of their uh, soccer schedule. They found all this out and they crafted a PDF with a malicious exploit in, in, embedded as well. And then uh, made a fake email that had the coach's name and then sent it to them like, oh, hey, I know you're a chaperone for the soccer team. So here's a schedule, updated schedule, have them run it. And now they have access inside the network because I believe it was an exploit. It wasn't just Usually PDFs don't just compromise machines when you click on them. There's a bunch of other things they can do, which we'll talk about right now. So malicious documents, they can have uh, multiple ways they can be malicious. Uh, there's macros, which are built in like programming language so that you can do, you know, things that make life easier for, for someone. So you could send them a, a document that has macros. To, so when they fill in their... Uh, income and number of dependents, it pops out, you know, all the tax information in the right way. But those could also be exploited to run code, download code from the internet, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, then you have actual exploits, which are literally you open it and now the badness has access. And usually these get fixed right away, um, you know, after the zero day is learned about and people know it exists. And then hopefully people update um, because sometimes a zero day comes out and people don't update their software. So they start sending Zero Day comes out, uh, there's the patch that comes out that week, probably. And then in that month following, you will likely see uh, attacker campaigns utilizing that exploit because the, the percentage of people who have patched this this week, you know, that patch is probably not happening until three months down the line, six months down the line. So they, they start up and roll up a campaign to hit that exploit all across the world, uh, utilizing, you know, these giant spam networks they have. Um, so exploits are still a scary thing and you got to look out for them. And then, uh, just links. And, uh, the main way that they use links is that they gather credentials. And what they do is they'll, I don't know if you've seen this, um, if you work in certain industries, you might've seen a lot of them, uh, other times, you know, you might've already entered information into one of these, but they're documents that say like invoice. And then when you open it up, uh, it says there's like a grayed out screen and it's, and it says, and it's just an image that's grayed out and over it, it, there's like a lock and it says like, oh, click here to unlock the document. And you click on the link, it opens a web browser and this web browser goes to a page that looks legitimate or attempts to, looks like Gmail, looks like Dropbox, looks like something. But if you look in the address bar, it's like hackedsite.com basically. Uh, you know, it's a little more clever than that if they can. Um, 
but it's uh, you know a portal for an established service that you know and trust. And it says enter your credentials to gain access to that document that we sent you. And then you enter your credentials, and now they have your credentials. Uh, sometimes there's a fake document on the other end. Sometimes it's just an error, and you're just like, I don't know what happened. Oh well. Um, but uh, at that point, you have given them credentials, and now they can attempt to hit the external services. Um, they might try your remote or VPN uh, services with that username password, or they just, you know, now have credentials that's going to help them in some way access some asset on the network somewhere. So I mean, it's often as simple as a link and just asking you to put in your user and password in something that is not trusted. And then the last thing, what do I have on here? Oh, is business email compromise. So this is still billions of dollars of fraud every year with this. And the originally business email compromise intended that an email was actually compromised. So they might compromise your CEO and their email inbox and then send an email from the CEO to the accountant and say, hey, can you wire money to this account immediately? Uh, I'm in the middle of something. Sign, Jane. And then accountant's like, oh, oh, that's my boss. I'm scared of my boss. And this sounds really urgent. I better send this wire transfer uh, to this, you know, account. And then, you know, a week later, CEO is like, what the hell are you talking about? I sent $30,000 to some random account. What are you talking about? So this is still super prevalent. Like I said, still billions of dollars every year lost to this attack. But at this point, they're not even compromising emails. Uh, they're just making it look like their name appears as the the boss's name or you, you know they're they're not even compromising the the actual email infrastructure they're just making their name look close enough to it and you know you put enough uh, bait out there there's going to be some fish so those are some of the internal ways we exploit humans to uh you know get that that money so, uh, yeah, that's the attacker stuff. I really had a lot of fun this class. Uh, let's do the quiz. Uh, and if you haven't joined us for the quiz before, the answers that you need to look at are going to be on my screen. Um, but you log in sort of like Jackbox, if you played that. Um, you log in to this uh, Kahoot.it. I'm going to get a room number. And then you log in there, and then we take the quiz, and we see who was really listening and who really cares about cybersecurity. Ah, da, 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 da. All right, so, oh God, the sound, the sound. I'm just gonna lower that significantly. Um, so yeah, you can go to kahoot.it and enter this room number, 710-7182. And then the, uh, we'll go through a quick set of questions. And then, uh, yeah, we'll wrap things up unless anyone wants to chat or ask questions. My mom is ready to take all of you down. Now she's going to be a cybersecurity professional in a matter of weeks, I'm certain. Uh, Plop is back. I think Plop took it last week, or maybe it was Negehama. But uh, regardless, welcome back, y'all. Happy to have you. I will give another minute or two because I do see... Oh, we got Radulf. A new face has entered the arena. Welcome, Radulf. Radolf? Um, looks like we've got 13 people watching, so I'm going to give it a sec. Yeah, thanks for joining, Radolf. Um... And uh, yeah, so 13 people, I will give it a, another 30 seconds or so, uh, just in case anyone else wants to join for the glory of winning an online quiz. All right, I think that might be everybody. Maybe one straggler is just trying to get everything together. Like, please don't click that start button until I get in. Or not. All right. All right, I got five seconds. Four, three, two, one. All right, that's the team then. Off we go. Feel free to play at home. 
So first question I think is a multiple answers, so it's worth extra points. Uh, what are primary attacker motives? Are they out to bother you personally? Are they looking for that money? Or maybe gathering information? Or they're just plain bored? Um, I know the feeling, attackers. I have been in the same boat. Yeah, that's right. Gathering info and getting that money. Because uh, information is also just basically straight up money. If you can figure out how to make it work. All right, all right. Good job, everybody. Uh, what organization releases a top 10 list of web vulnerabilities? This was a little bit earlier, so I don't know if you were in here, Rodolph, but uh, uh, this, this five letter organization releases a list of the top 10 web vulnerabilities almost every year. It kind of doesn't change every year, so I don't think they need to do it every time. Yeah, and this is still really loud. I hope it's not going through the mic. Uh, the answer was a wasp. Hopefully it allowed lowercase if you did that as well. Oh yes, I do have their tab open. Good call. Look at that social engineering. Good job, Eleanor. <laughs> uh, yeah, oh wasp. Nice. We've got a few takers. All right, true or false. The easiest way to access an internal network is from attacking the external network. So we talked a little bit about this, you know, you know, a modern business has many external, you know, assets that, uh, yeah, we got, uh, even split here, but no, that it's much easier to access the humans inside that have internal access. The external network is usually closed down pretty tight, uh, or at least it's, easier to do that than to keep humans from being uh, curious or helpful. <laughs> uh, what's the puzzle? I forgot this one. These ones are always hard. I, ah, yes. So I'm going to get out of the way here. But blanks exploit blanks on blanks and create blanks. So what is the thing that it does the exploitation? And then what do exploits exploit? Like there's a particular thing that exploits hit or uh, go up against. And then those things that exploits hit exist on something. What are those things? And then all of this together creates this other thing that uh, businesses worry a lot about for some reason. But uh, yeah, the idea is to get those those little thingers in the order that they fill those blanks. What exploits what on what and creates what? Uh, I can't even tell what this means, but yes, uh, threats exploit vulnerabilities on assets and create risk. Those ones are toughy ones, but it looks like, yeah, three of you got it. Nice. All right. Uh, Internet of Things devices are usually configured securely. I mean, this is the wave of the future. We talked about last week how many of them there are. They always, I mean, those things, nobody has ever hacked a smart microwave or a smart refrigerator or a smart toothbrush. Like these things are in impenetrable, right? Right? Question mark? <laughs> the answer is no, they are usually not, and there are no regulations in place, which is a travesty. Uh, all right, moving up, Nagihama on fire. Oh, another multi-selector. Which one is this one? Ah, what are some top web app vulnerabilities? Okay, I'm not in the way of any of them. Uh, we've got SQL injection, broken authentication, insufficient monitoring and malware attacks. I mean, all the answers could be on this website right here. Do you remember seeing some of these on there? Which ones were on there? I kind of briefly mentioned all of them. I should have been more explicit, but uh, 
Yeah, so insufficient monitoring was the other one of those three. Um, malware attacks, sure, but malware is usually installed on like a user machine or a device. Usually malware isn't hitting the external part of the network. So all of these things can hit the external network and uh, lead to being compromised. Whoa, Plop took the reins. Jumping ahead there. Uh, human trust is easier to exploit than network defenses. I mean, humans, I mean, we, we put a lot in a box. We shove down our deepest, darkest fears and desires. Oh, right, but yeah, no, it's still easy to exploit that stuff. <laughs> uh, all right, I think Plop took it with that multi-selector. I uh, got another one with times two points. What are some social engineering techniques? Uh, business email compromise, credential harvesting, a USB drop, or insecure configurations. I mean, those are all those are all attacks or ways you can attack, I guess. Threat vectors, perhaps. Yeah, so the only one that wasn't, I mean, credential harvesting is iffy, but that is sort of getting someone to enter their credentials is harvesting. And uh, USB drop for sure, business email compromise again for sure. Insecure configurations, that is more the nature of the asset itself is not configured, uh, which you could blame on humans, but you didn't manipulate humans to make it insecure. Uh, all right. Last one. It is possible to be completely safe on the internet. I mean, I forgot to explicitly mention this point, but uh, I've said it in other ways uh, over the course of this course. And yeah, no, you can't. Uh, again, with we talked about defense in depth er earlier, which is what a corporation tries to do. You know, layer the defenses so at some point you might catch the attacker. And uh, as a human, we can try to make ourselves as safe as possible when we use the internet and how our data is stored on it. But again, it's really just trying to make the carriage really difficult to get. Um, because the more sort of roadblocks you put in the way and the more difficult it is to try, usually they're just going, going to pivot to an easier target um, unless they're really, really determined or unless they are sponsored by your government and they really want inside. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, the poll. I always love hearing what uh, which part of the attacker mindset is the most interesting to you. Geopolitical cyber espionage, uh, finding holes in web applications is this one, cybercrime and the dark net, or social engineering. All different aspects of attacker stuff. Oh, interesting. They like the finding holes and cybercrime and social engineering, but geopolitical espionage, yeah, but no big deal. Y'all can just fight over lines in the sand, whatever. Great. All right. Awesome. Cool. So I think, I think someone pulled ahead pretty heavily. Rodolfo, first timer on the board. Negihama, welcome back. And uh, Mr. Plops. Congratulations, my my friend, my dear. Uh, thank you all for participating, and thanks to anyone who's just watching and enjoying the show, and Eleanor uh, giving P our contestants hints that they shouldn't have. Uh, lastly, uh, before, let's see, oh, 59. Wow, I am really cutting it close. So uh, I guess we won't do a Q&A like I wanted to do, but I wanted to do cool hacker stuff and we got to do cool hacker stuff. So uh, briefly, I mean, I think I should just take up this slide and just show what I put on the website um, because that is where I've... I, I have the sort of links to check out after the class. So the, the links I'm mentioning here in the slides is Rachel Tobach steals a CNN reporter's data right before DEF CON. It's five minutes, super interesting, just how she gets his address and then sort of pivots off of that. 
uh, Kit Boga. Uh, he does Twitch streams, I think, once or twice a week, where basically he scams scammers. It is so fun to watch because he has a lot of fun with it. He has a grandma character that he loves to play. That, or at least that's my favorite character he plays, is the grandma. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Uh, Kid Vogue is great. Uh, there, you know, there are videos from anywhere from 20 minutes to two hours with him just looping these people. And, and the great thing about watching Kit Boga is he breaks down, uh, what script they're use, utilizing, like why they're trying to get me to do this and then why they're trying to get me to do this. And yeah, grandma, grandma, grandma Edna, <laughs> it's hilarious because oftentimes they give you money to do things for them that uh, would be difficult for them to do to basically like, like launder the money. So he'll like have grandma Edna just spend like $4,000 on like a scooter or <laughs> a tricycle or something. It's great. It's really fun to watch. Uh, and then, uh, what I built most of the Metasploit, uh, part that we used in the class today is the Metasploit Unleash tutorial on the offensive security site. It's a great introduction to Metasploit. And, uh, yeah, it sort of just walks you through all its all of its various capabilities and uh, how to attack things with it. Uh, if you want to do a little deep dive into something, I highly recommend either the book Ghost in the Wires by Kevin Mitnick, um, sort of talking about his exploits in the 90s. Another interesting one is Spam Nation by Brian Krebs, um, who's a tech journalist who sort of uh, documents and interviews the giant enterprise spam network made up of mostly cyber criminal organizations or arms of the Yakuza, the Mafia, uh, the Mexican gangs, uh, drug gangs. They see spam as like an alternate way of income that can support their other things. And when they want to do cyber crime, it helps to have a spam network to utilize. Very fascinating. Uh, and then lastly, uh, this website over the wire where you can, they've got these like Linux Linux shells open that you can sort of like, it will give you a few commands at the time at a time to try and learn what these commands can do and then throw you into a shell where you can use those commands to escalate privileges, do things you're not supposed to do by exploiting insecure configurations within it. Uh, yeah, plops over the wires, super fun. It can be uh, a head banging against wall uh, at some points, but uh, you know, once you break through that wall, there is a carrot on the other side and it's delicious. Um, I said I would try to save Q&A this one, but uh, we may be the next one, but I also, also got a bunch of cool stuff to show you for Defenders. We will definitely do for the fourth episode, which is the final episode of each season, just a quick recap of cybercrime news, and then we'll definitely do some Q and A, uh, get some people in on the disc Discord so we can chat. And uh, yeah, that's the episode this week. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed yourselves, and thank you so much for joining. I am going to switch over to this mode real quick, but it is 6 p.m. I'm kind of hungry. My cat is probably meowing uh, for food to anyone who will listen. And so I'm going to go feed my kitty cat. And, uh, and, oh, okay, Radulf, Radulf is studying software engineering and have to decide between cybersecurity and big data. So I kind of mess with big data in a cybersecurity context, and I love that stuff. But definitely uh, reach out to me. Uh, I've got the Discord, my Twitch, YouTube, all that stuff. There's ways to get a hold of me, Radulf. So if you want to get in touch, uh, and this goes to anyone, if you want to get in touch, I'll arrange time so we can chat, like phone call chat, uh, like 15, 30 minutes just to get an idea of where you're at and where you want to go and uh, how I can help you get there. So a pleasure as always, my friends, and uh, I will see you next week for Defender stuff. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.